Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He's here to do miracles for us. Amen? Amen. He's here to prophesy his word to us. So let us welcome this morning the man of God, Pastor Joel Fraser. Thank you, Sister Carol, for that wonderful introduction. And could we put our hands together for the Lord? He is ready to be praised. I hope you are ready to receive. I said, I hope you are ready to receive this morning. The Lord has placed a tremendous word upon my heart. Hallelujah. Could we, could we get an atmosphere of worship, Brother Samuel? Hallelujah. We are in the presence of the Lord. Let every hand be lifted. Let every voice be lifted. He's worthy of praise. He's worthy. He's worthy of glory. Hallelujah. Sister Denise, lead us into that song, Hallelujah. this morning. Oh, 
This morning, hallelujah. Father and God, we give you all the praise. We thank you once again for this opportunity to minister your word to your people. And Lord, I pray that as your word goes forth today, Lord, you're going to calibrate our hearts. You're going to bring forth transformation and change. I thank you, Lord, that there's going to be a shift of power. There's going to be a release of power into the atmosphere, into our lives, into our bodies. And Lord, we are careful to give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory in the powerful name of Jesus. If you have your Bibles before you take your seats this morning, we are in the gospel according to Mark. Mark chapter 3, we're reading the first five verses. Mark chapter 3 from verse 1 to 5. When you have found it, give me a big amen. Amen. I'm reading this morning. I just have an excitement. I don't know why. Maybe it's because of the word and what God is going to do in our hearts, in our lives. I'm reading from the New King James. It says, and he entered the synagogue again. Someone say again. again. And a man was there who had a withered hand. So they watched him closely whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, step forward. Then he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill. But they kept silent. Jesus wants to silence all of your critics, all of your detractors, all of your enemies. He's going to silence them in this upcoming season. Amen. They kept silent. Amen. And when he had looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts. You want to know what gets God angry? The hardness of our hearts. He is grieved by the hardness of our hearts. When we refuse to submit to his will. When we refuse to submit to his plan. When we refuse and we decide to go our own way. God gets angry. He's grieved. I say to us, let's not grieve the heart of God. Amen. He said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out. And his hand was restored as whole as the other. May the Lord bless the reading of his word or hearing. And or hearing to the reading of his word. You may have your seats this morning. And for all of us gathered in the presence of the Lord, the subject for this morning's sermon comes straight from the text. Stretch out your hand. Stretch out your hand. And these four simple words spoken into the man's life literally transformed his life. And I want to say to you that these simple four words this morning 
has the power to change your life. I said these four words. Has the power to change your life. I gl I'm glad I got your attention. I see everybody is looking. What is he talking about? Amen. God has a word for you this morning. Because these words were not just a command to be obeyed. More than that, these words were prophetic. They had creative capability. In other words, they had the power to produce, to download something into the man's life that was not there before. That is the power of God's word. It could produce things in your life that you didn't have before. In fact, the instant that these words were released from the mouth of Jesus, something shifted in the man's life. There was a shift. And God has sent me here this morning to speak words that will cause a shift to take place in your life. A shift is coming in your life. God is going to shift some things around. He's going to shift some things out. He's going to shift some things into your life this morning. Because Jesus said, these words that I speak, they are words of spirit. They are words of life. These are not ordinary words this morning. I want you to receive these words as words from the, the, the mouth of God. These words are coming down from the very portals of heaven, straight from the heart of God. God is releasing words into our hearts, into our lives, words that are pregnant with power and possibility. And these words, when they were spoken into the man's life, literally rewrote his future. They gave him access to something that he didn't have before. Because before these words were spoken into this man's life, he could not move his hand. His hand, you know, far less stretch it out. His hand was withered. And this morning, God wants to speak words into your life that gives you access to a new season, that gives you access a new future, a future that you did not have access to before. Why? Because of the limitations, because of the restrictions upon your life. There are many people walking about. They may smile, but they have limitations, restrictions that are keeping them from moving forward in the things of God. And God has sent me here to speak words. That will free you of all of these limitations, all of these restrictions. These words that are going to break all of those restrictions upon your life. God has sent me here to speak powerful, prophetic, and creative words. Words that can produce new life into your experience. Words that will shift you into a new future. A future that's filled with possibilities. A future that's filled with potential. But to participate in this new future, you're going to have to cooperate with what God is doing. We need to be flexible and pliable with the hand of God, with the voice of God, with the plan of God, with the program of God. We need to cooperate. Because do you know that you could stop the flow of God's power in your life? Do you know that? The Bible says that the, when you believe and hold on to the traditions of men, it makes the word of God. Could you imagine that? The word that created the heavens and the earth, Sister Carol. Jesus says, when you hold on to the traditions of men, it has the power to make the word of God, the all-powerful word of God, of no effect. You can be your worst enemy. The Bible tells us that by the words of our mouth, we are ensnared. Sometimes you talk yourself out of a blessing. You shoot yourself in the foot. You remember there was this incident. Was it Zachariah? He was in the temple. 
he and his wife Elizabeth, they were getting on in years and age. They were asking God for a son. Son wasn't coming. But then one day, there was a shift. God sent an angel to speak words into his life. Words to shift him into a new future. The angel said, I am Gabriel. I came from the very presence of God to speak words into your life. Mr. Zachary said, what are you talking about? I don't believe that. He almost short circuited the flow of God in his life. You know what God had to do? God had to shut him up. Say so you're going to be dumb until these words that I speak come to pass. You know why he had to make him shut up and dumb? Because he would have cheated himself out of the blessing and the favor that God wanted to release into his life. Sometimes we need to keep our mouth shut. Because you talk yourself out of the blessing. You talk yourself out of what God wants to do. So I want you to understand that these words have the power to shift some things in your life. These words have the power to release new life. They are creative. They are prophetic. The thing is about prophetic words. Prophetic words speak about a new future. They are futuristic words. So you don't judge prophetic words by saying, ah, you know, I don't believe that. It's not something that you could see because it's in the future. You receive it by faith. You say, yes, Lord, I receive your word. This is what Zachariah had to do. And that, that's the difference between Zachariah and Mary, remember? The same angel Gabriel went to Mary. And she had a question, but her question was more from the standpoint that she couldn't understand how she was going to be impregnated. And so she asked for wisdom. She said, but how can this be, seeing that I don't know a man? So she wasn't asking questions out of doubt, but out of wanting to gain new understanding. And the angel said, the spirit of God is going to come upon you. And you know what Mary said? She didn't say, nah, that's something too hard to believe. Nah, little old me from Nazareth. And that's what some people say. When God speaks a word, God sends a servant to speak into your life, you say, nah, I can't believe that. But what was the confession of Mary? You know what was the confession? She says, be it unto me. According to what? According to your word. She didn't see anything. She didn't see anything. All she had to go on was the word. A word that was spoken with power. A word that was pregnant with possibility. She said, be it unto me. According to your word. This is why I say we have to cooperate. And the Bible says that as soon as she said that, the angel departed and the Spirit of God, because she had given her consent with the word of her mouth, with the power of agreement, there was a shift, there was a release. The Spirit of God came upon her. And the, 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 there was a conception, there was a birthing. God wants to birth something in your life. That's why I think I feel so excited. God is going to build some things in your life. Do not underestimate the power of the word of God spoken by the servant of God. I am not trying to big up myself. This applies to any servant of God. Never underestimate the power of the spoken word coming through the servant of God. Because the word of God, the word that you respect, the word that you submit to is the word that will produce miracles in your life. Breakthroughs in your life. You see, but many people, they hear the word and they say, in their hearts, they reject. They say, no, I can't believe that. I can't see that. Now remember, Whenever God speaks, 
the people are they, they're in the same position as you and I, you know. They have nothing to go on but the word. When Mary heard the word, when Zachariah heard the word, he had nothing to go on but the voice of the angel. They're no different to you. But what it makes the difference is the heart of the recipient. Is the power of agreement. She says, be it unto me according to your word. And there was a release. There was a shift. That is what I want us to see this morning. We have to cooperate with what God is doing. We need to be flexible, pliable, because God wants to expand your thinking. Some of us, we are restricted by our thinking, by the traditions of men. And so, we, God can't do what he wants to do in your life because you are restricted in your thinking. That's why the Bible says, be transformed by what? By the renewing of your mind. God wants to expand your thinking. God wants you to see that in his presence, all things are possible. You heard what I said? In the presence of God, all things are possible. Not some things. All things. Jesus said to the man, he says, Lord, help me out here now. Jesus says, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes. I challenge you this morning. Step out in faith. I challenge you. Expand your thinking. Believe that all things are possible. Because like the man in the text, the man in the text, he was restricted by his withered hand. You ever see somebody with a withered hand? It's like they have this hand and it's dead. It can't do nothing. They can't raise it. They can't use it. It's like they have a hand, but they don't have a hand. They carry in dead weight. No functionality. And because of that, you're restricted. And some of you here this morning, you are restricted. There are things that you want to do, but somehow you can't do it. There are things that you should be able to do, but you can't do it. Why? You're restricted. Why are you restricted? Because something in your life has withered. Something in your life has dried up. And it is causing a restriction. It is causing a limitation. Now we are not told how this man's hand got withered. We don't know if he was born that way. We don't know if he suffered an injury. We don't know if he contracted some disease. We don't know. All we know is that he had a withered hand. He couldn't use it. He was restricted. Essentially, he was carrying around a dead hand. He was carrying around dead weight. Some of you this morning, you're carrying around dead weight. That is restricting you. That is limiting you. God wants to set you free this morning. Set you free. And I want to say to you that you are in the right place this morning. If there's anything in your life that has withered, you are in the right place. You know why? You know why I could say that? Because Jesus is here. And in his presence, there's what? Liberty. There's freedom. There's healing. There's breakthrough. Anything that you need, it's here. It's right here. We don't need some minister with a foreign accent to come down and tell us that Jesus is here. You need somebody from America to come and tell you that Jesus is here? No. no. What did Jesus say? Where the twos and the what? The trees are gathered. We are more than two and three here. Where the twos and the trees are gathered together in my name, I am what? In the midst to do what? To bless. So he's here. Understand that Jesus is here. Amen. Amen. He's here. And so he could deliver you from any withered condition. Now the thing is this. Your withered condition may not be physical at all. The man in the text, he had a physical condition that, that brought about restriction. But your condition may not be physical at all. Maybe something in your soul that's withered. It may be emotions. I don't know, maybe you suffered some type of trauma. 
something happened in your childhood or something that caused trauma and pain and you, you, you're carrying a wrong emotional dead weight you're carrying around this thing that has withered your emotions have been withered or someone may have betrayed you we have so much betrayal taking place someone you know may have disappointed you someone may have stabbed you in the back anybody here get experience that you get stabbed in the back you're looking fake but you get it and you're withered you dry up, your emotions are scarred, you're hurt. Or it may be a mental condition. Or a memory. You know, the enemy has a way. Sometimes he has these triggers. Triggers. Sometimes you go there, you go in this place, you hear a song, you see something, you see something, and all of a sudden, there's a download of these memories. And it's like you're reliving that whole negative experience. You feel like your whole life withered. We need to be delivered from those memories. That mental condition. Or still, it may be a spiritual condition. You feel like all of your spiritual life has oozed out. You're dry like a biscuit. Ready to break. All of your life gone. You're not feeling to pray. You're feeling to sing. You're feeling to come to church. You're withered. Dry like a biscuit. But I want to say to you this morning, whether your condition is physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, Jesus is able to set you free. Amen. I said Jesus is able to restore life into your body life into emotions life into your mental faculties life into your spirit this morning it doesn't matter how you became withered it doesn't matter when you became withered it does not even matter why you are withered jesus wasn't concerned with all of that he didn't go and ask the man to fill out a survey tell me Tell me a story. You see, when you understand that you have access to power and authority, you don't have to go through all of them gymnastics. You don't have to jump through all them loops and all the, this navigation course and, you know, 10-page thing. You have to fill out your whole life story. Jesus I had time for that. He ministered to thousands. You think Jesus had time to go and tell you, fill out the survey for me? I want to know what happened 10 years ago. Tell me how this happened. And you're insane and you're doing this and you're doing that and the other and the other. Jesus has the power to speak a word into your life and bring about transformation and change. When you understand authority and power, you don't have to go through all of that. Jesus wasn't concerned with all of that. All he was concerned about was the fact that there's this man, he's in a withered condition, and he says, I have come to set the captives free. I have come to deliver you. I want to say to you this morning, Jesus is here to deliver and set you free. You can be set free right now. You can be set free today. You can be set free before the service. Not next week. There's power. The Bible says that the Lord was present. The power of the Lord was present to heal. The presence of God makes the difference. That is the level of faith I want us to have. The level of expectation. When you come through those doors, you come with the expectation that I am coming to meet the King of Glory. Amen. King of Glory is in our midst this morning. Amen. You didn't come here to hear a man, to see a man. You came here to meet with your God. Amen. He is here. He's here to heal. He's here to deliver. He can, he can fix all of that withered condition that you, you have right now. And Jesus, when he saw the man, that is what he was concerned about. And I imagine it was a pitiful sight. And I want to say to you that God is aware of the things that concern you. God is aware of the things that are withered in your life. God is aware. Do not for one minute think 
that it has escaped God's atten attention. He knows what you're facing. He knows about the situation. He knows. He knows about what they said. God knows. Take it to Jesus. Take it to the Lord in prayer. He knows. And because he knows, he has come to do something about it. I want someone to hear me this morning. This God that we're talking about, he's not a God of old talk. He's a God of power. Amen. He's a personal God. And this leads me to the first point I want to make this morning. Is that Jesus is always moved by compassion to meet you at your point of need. He's moved. He is moved by compassion. He's not static. He's not a static God. He don't stick. I know some people think God is stick. God does stick. He is moved with compassion. He is sticking. He is moved. And he has moved into your life. He has moved into the building. And many people don't truly understand the difference between compassion sympathy and empathy there's a a very important difference compassion is what moves us into action to do something for others that they can't do for themselves that is compassion compassion is not about old talk it has some people that talk and talk and talk yeah boy, we could do this we could do that compassion is people of action. They say, you know what? I am going to come. I am going to assist. I am going to do such and such. It's a doing word. It's an active word. Sympathy says, brother, sister, I feel for you, you know. I really feel in what you're going through there. That's sympathy. And that, that's that. Empathy says, brother, sister, I feel in with your boy. It's like I in your shoes. I can feel, I can see exactly what's going on. That is empathy. You know what is compassion? Compassion says, brother, sister, I'm here to help you. What I can do. That is compassion. Compassion is about action, not talk. That is the difference. The God that we serve, he's a God of compassion. He's a God of action. He says, this kingdom that I am talking about is not a kingdom of old talk. Paul said that in 1 Corinthians 4.20. He said, this is not a kingdom about talk, but this is a kingdom about power. Power to heal. Power to deliver. Power to set you free this morning. That is the kind of kingdom that we're talking about. Not a two by four jokey kingdom. No, no, no. This kingdom we're talking about has power to intervene in your life, has power to turn around that withered situation in your life, has power to resurrect that dead situation in your life. And because of that fact, because the God that we serve is a God of compassion, it says that Jesus is moved to act. He's moved to do something about it. Jesus comes to meet us right where we are. Did you notice? He went into the synagogue. Where was the man? He was in the synagogue. Where did Jesus go? In the synagogue. Jesus is coming to meet you right where you are. Right where you are, he's coming. He's coming. He's not a distant, far away, disconnected God. No, 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 no. Some people may worship God like that, but the God that we serve, he's a personal God. He comes to you right where you are. That's why the text says, Jesus entered the synagogue again. Somebody say again. again. Jesus entered the synagogue again. And there was a man there who had a withered hand. 
Now, why does the writer tell us that he entered the synagogue again? Why is he telling us that? It's because in the previous verses, Jesus had a clash with the Pharisees. Now, Jesus would often clash with the Pharisees because of his activities on the Sabbath. He had a clash. What happened was, Jesus, on the Sabbath, he and his disciples, they were tra traveling through the grain fields. And when you're traveling, now remember in those days, their, their primary mode of transport was, was P2. They would walk everywhere. The disciples got hungry. What do you do when you're hungry? You're walking. You see a, a plum tree, a chenna tree, a mango tree. What, what do you think you're going and do? Sabbath or no Sabbath? You're going and pick that and eat it. That's what the disciples did. Jesus wasn't concerned about that. And would you believe all of a sudden these fellas just jump out of the bush. I catch you. Do you know? Because in those days they didn't have cell phone camera. You didn't have security camera on the lamppost. In fact, they didn't have lampposts in those days. So what was their strategy? These, these Pharisees, let me tell you the extent of their wickedness. And this is the kind of detractors that some of us have. Let me tell you the extent of their wickedness. You know what these men used to do? Wherever and whenever Jesus was moving about, they were moving with Jesus. Hiding. Hiding behind here. You know what they were hiding to do? Not just a, every, they wanted to trap Jesus in everything that he said or did. So I could imagine on the Sabbath was the day when all of them come out. Because what are they doing? They want to trap him. So as soon as the disciples probably pick the grain of corn, they probably didn't start to eat it yet. He said, I'll catch you. How could you allow these fellas to break our most holy Sabbath? That's what they're saying to Jesus. Jesus said, all the fellas and do all the homework, man. He said, all the fellas need to wheel and turn. Come again. All they do all the homework. All they didn't read about David. He said, back in the day when, in the time of Abiathar the priest, he said, David and his partners came back from a campaign. They was hungry. You know what they did? They went in the tabernacle. And you know what they take? The most holy shoe bread that was only lawful for the priest to eat. And that is what David and his partners eat. By in here, all you're complaining. Oh, yeah, nothing to say. Nah, in all your eyes, David is David. But as soon as my disciples pick a grain of corn, you're telling me about Sabbath? Jesus said, wheel and turn. Come again. Oh, yeah, ready yet. And to give them the clincher, to give them the punchline, Jesus says, the Sabbath was made for man. And not man for the Sabbath. He said, oh, they have it wrong side. And you know, today, you have a lot of people have it wrong side still. Yeah. Because the Sabbath was given to be a blessing and not a burden. Jesus said, it is good. It is okay to do good on the Sabbath. And in another passage, he said, all oh, your fellas is hypocrites. He said, if one or all you have a donkey... And the donkey fall down in a pit. You will, you will wait. You will wait hours and hours to go and pull the donkey out. Because it's the Sabbath. No. All you're going and pull the donkey out. So there's a hypocrite. That's what Jesus said. Because the Sabbath was given as a blessing and not a burden. Remember that. Always remember that. The Sabbath was given as a blessed and not a burden. And then to crown it off, hear what Jesus tell them. I like Jesus, you know. Hear what Jesus tell them. He say, you know what? If anybody ought to know about the Sabbath thing, it's me. You know why? Because I am Lord of the Sabbath. I am the man who created the Sabbath. I am the Lord. I am the owner. I am the creator. 
You can't tell me about Sabbath. You can't tell me what to do on the Sabbath. I am the Lord of the Sabbath. Who is you? You're out of place. That is what Jesus was telling them, fellas. So when Mark tells us now that Jesus entered again into the Sabbath, now you understand why he's saying that. Because the previous week, he had this clash with them about Sabbath. He had this big conflict. Now when do they go to the synagogue? On the Sabbath. But although they had this clash and this conflict, Jesus didn't allow that to deter him. He still went again into the Sabbath. Now he's going knowing that conflict is awaiting him eh? because that is the time when they, you know, they gland his rays. You ever hear that saying? Your gland rays? That is the time when they gland his rays on the Sabbath. So Jesus know they gland rays. He know when he go in there on the Sabbath, they're going to try something. But what I want you to see is the heart of God. Jesus is not afraid of conflict. He don't back down from conflict. Jesus don't back down from your critics, from your haters, from your, you know, your detractors. One thing I've discovered. If you are to achieve anything of significance in this life, you're going to have to deal with your haters, your detractors, your critics, your backstabbers. You're going to have to confront them. Yes. Me saying you had a fight with them, you know. But you're going to have to confront them. You're going to have to deal with them. And Jesus was prepared to face the conflict. And that's good news. Because what this is telling us is that Jesus will do whatever it takes to get to you. He'll do whatever it takes to meet you at your point of need. Why did Jesus go into the synagogue? Because he knew there was a sick man in there. He knew there was a man with a withered condition. You see, Jesus is attracted to places where the sick, the oppressed, the demonized are located. That is where you're going to find Jesus. That's where you're going to find Jesus. So that's why I can tell you Jesus is here today. Because there are needs represented here. Amen. That's why he came. He says, I came to do what? To set the captives free. Amen. I came to proclaim the gospel to the, to the heartbroken. This is why he came. So he entered the synagogue again. Amen. He was not deterred by conflict. He entered the church again. He continues to go to the homes again. Why? Because he is moved with compassion. Jesus is not going to give the critics any leverage. And I want to say to you this morning.